sir, first and foremost, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, welcome to the show. Uh, and this is really impromptu. We just met maybe two hours ago and just do, it was a briefing here at the Astro Summit and you were just dropping some gems and I just, uh, I, I love it. I appreciate that and I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, just talking about the, the transition. Actually, before we have, uh, I want to talk about transition, talk to me about your socks because I see Alexander <laughs> Hamilton. Yes, and, sir. And who's on the other? you have a different someone else on the no, other side? No, they're both Alexander Hamilton. Okay, so not Aaron Burr or anything? No, no Burr, sir. <laughs> What's yeah. the story behind the socks? Uh, the story behind the socks is, uh, so my good friend Todd Simmons is a, yeah. a big sock connoisseur, you know, yeah. and there was a period where we were having like this sock war on Facebook and uh, going back and forth and, you know, who had the the toughest socks yeah and uh you know like when i'm speaking or something like you know i like to say like i'm channeling my my alexander hamilton so like i got these socks I can't are you remember. challenging people to duels <laughs> no I'm not, not, no duels uh, well maybe a verbal duel or a mental duel you yeah, know yeah, yeah. a battle of wits but uh yeah no shooting here uh but yeah i like to wear these socks man just to kind of remind myself that it's okay to think differently yeah. and, and be a maverick and you know, be visionary and creative, and, and sometimes like great things come out of that. So I'm just a big fan of Hamilton, big fan of the music, and and rock the socks to suit. Rock the socks. I noticed them during the briefing because I was sitting in the front row. Hey, I like that you said you. I want to talk about think differently and uh, be a maverick. What's the challenge that most service members have with that that mindset? I guess while they're in, and then the second part of that, once they're starting to exit the military and maybe like their first year yeah well I mean the obvious challenge while you're in is the the hierarchical nature yeah. of what we do right and in a lot of cases like there's an expectation that you get to a certain level before you have vision and leadership and creativity when the opposite is actually true which is you're born with certain God-given talent like I believe that I'm creative in the way I think is because of a product to the talent God gave me plus you know the environments that I grew up in uh, growing up as a special operator you know what what I told people earlier today when I spoke was about I had a, a boss that told me as a young E4 that one man could change the Air Force and uh, I really ascribe to that and I always try to to do things irregardless of the structure above me you know, the pressures and all that, I was always like, hey, why can't we challenge the status quo? Why can't we do things differently? And uh, I think it led me to, to continue as a special operator because in that environment, it was actually valued. Like it was more about your capability and less about your rank or position uh, in terms of what you could do, you know, to affect the mission and how much responsibility even you could have. And I was lucky to be in those environments. So I, I just kind of found places where they appreciated divergent thinkers and, and did it. And, and I mean, even if I wasn't, if I was somewhere where it wasn't, I did it anyway, right? Yeah. Because like, I'm gonna be me at the end of the day and you know, it's okay if you're a true leader, then you're okay with somebody challenging and challenging assumptions because you know, like that's how iron sharpens iron. That's how you get better. How do you balance that like after the military, right? Just challenging assumptions. Cause like to me, it's a different battlefield and there's so many skills that we learn in the military and kind of have to be a certain way, but yeah, how, how do you? Uh, you'd be surprised that in post-military life, like the difference is that people want to make money, right? So yeah. if you challenge assumptions in a way that creates more revenue or drives more innovation, uh, you might find yourself really appreciated. You know what I mean? Now, th there's obviously a structure everywhere there's a boss uh, I mean, I work for myself, but I also have customers that I'm beholden to. But I I know my strengths, and I know that, you know, freedom is one of my values. Freedom in terms of, you know, supporting our way of life and supporting our country, but also supporting the way I think and the way I like to move. And so I find places to work and people to work with that appreciate that freedom and want me to be autonomous and, and, and go and do things and learn. Um, and once you find that sweet spot, like, and, and, you know, if you help them make money, then yeah, they're all about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I think you may be surprised, like in, in industry, innovation isn't like a buzzword or a thing that we do to stay ahead of, of 
it's about staying ahead of the competition, which directly affects your bottom line. So it's a necessity, you know what I mean? Like we're saying it's a necessity, but in practice a lot of times in the military, it's they want the status quo, like people want comfort. They're not as comfortable with change. Industry has to change to survive. So you might find yourself as a maverick being more comfortable on the outside than you are on the inside. Blockbuster, like I, you know, we laugh and joke, oh, yeah. but their perfect example is they didn't want to innovate or change, and of course yep. they went out of business. And at one time they were top dog, right? So yeah. in Hollywood video as well. Yeah, if you don't like change, try irrelevancy. Like that's good. I like that. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, ask Blockbuster. Yeah, that might be a good uh, name for this episode. Yeah, that's good. Sure. Yeah. So do you think that's the biggest for people transitioning? One of the biggest things they need to understand is that's the difference between innovation in the military versus the civilian sector is necessity. I, I think, I mean, I think there's necessity in the military. There's just a ton of bureaucracy Yeah. and there's not the need for a bottom line. Like, I mean, we're conditioned to spend money, you know, in, <laughs> in this, this dude, they're <laughs> conditioned every September to, to save money. Right. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, it is different, you know? And again, like if you can prove, you may have the best idea in the military, and I still don't think we're at the point where like immediately it shoots to the top of the pile and it's executed like you got to go through these echelons. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in industry, like they're thirsty for, hey, you got the next best idea and, and it can get us there now. Like they're, they're far more thirsty for it, I find. So how long have you been retired? Uh, one year, first of July would be one year. Oh, so we're just, we're past the one year mark. We just passed the one okay, year. Okay, well, happy one year anniversary. Uh, thanks. I guess. But I think to me, there's, I imagine, I'm, I'm still active duty, but I would imagine, and I just by talking with a lot of friends who have retired, there's always a lot of ref reflection, especially, and uncertainty, especially in that first year. But looking back on your transition during this time, what is one skill that you overlooked in the military, but now realize and see the value uh, one year later? I always thought that like my network and, and the people that that I had befriended and helped and that had helped me in the military, like I never looked at it as something that was marketable that would turn into, you know, a career for me. Um, and, you know, I think that was good and bad, like good because like I wasn't, I was friends with people because I was just genuinely friends with people. I yeah. was helping people because like, I get a certain satisfaction like I that's how I actualize like is kind of growing other people and helping people out and I, f I take a lot of pride in that and I get fulfillment from that um, but then you know I transitioned and like people were willing to help me you know that you know I probably hadn't talked to in a while or thought about in a while like and you know I thought it was really kind of cool like you yeah. know things that I had invested in for the right reasons turned out to be things that helped me, you know, on the outside, um, without even ever really thinking about it. So that, that's what I would say is like my, my skill at networking, my, my friendships, my relationships that, that I had nurtured and just the way I had treated people. Actually, you don't think of that as a skill, right? But, you know, you know, being a good teammate and being, you know, a person of of respect and and that treats people with respect and and a person of your word like it you know when you come around on the other side people know it's still you right and you have more you have less transactional relationships because a lot of a lot of the military relationships can be transactional like I work for you and I need you know this relationship because I want you to help me um, and then but when you're giving to people you know what I mean? And then it comes around and you're like, hey man, can you, can you help me, help me uh, navigate this maze? Or, you know, I need some information on X or Y. And they're, uh, they're like, man, absolutely. You know? And I remember that time, yeah. which I'm like, oh yeah, sure. But I don't even really, might not even remember it, but you know, people come up to me all the time and go, hey man, you helped me out with this and I really appreciated it. That's awesome. And everybody should strive for that. Like at the end of your career, that that should be a marker of success is how many people you touched and how many people you helped, uplifted, whatever. Not necessarily how high you rose on a totem pole. 
No, that's that's awesome. And actually, I remember during the the, um, the brief, a couple or panel um, a few hours ago, you talked about the civilian side. Like, hey, I'm nice. People, are, I'm nice because I actually want to be, or you know, and all, yeah. you know. And I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's in my wheelhouse to yeah. to act that way and be a good teammate because I grew up like believing the team and the dude on the right, left and right was everything. You know, what I mean, regardless of the circumstance. And now I find teams that are like that to work with. And, you know, it's it's fabulous. Like, you know, I mean, it's I'm like, man, this is great. Like everybody I work with, um, it's just like I, um, I was still in the military. Like I got great teammates and, yeah. and, you know, we do things socially and blah, blah. And I, I still have my military network of friends. Like I come here and I can't walk through the hallway, right? Um, but that's a, that's a great space to be in like you know as a person is being widely connected and having a lot of connections i want to just stay on the topic of the transition because it, there was so again I, I think i've mentioned a couple times you were just dropping gems um but i was i was thinking of, and i wanted to ask this during the panel but there were a lot of questions and i was like well i'll just ask them afterward but how has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for success today so maybe when you were a kid or a teenager or your first, you know, 10 years in the military? Um, think about that. Um, I mean, I think I've had many failures, you know what I mean? Do you have a favorite failure story? <laughs> a favorite failure story. Um, I, I wouldn't really consider it a failure, but I talked about and, and directly related to transitioning. Like I got out and I went to work immediately for you know, a friend of the family, um, in a, in a director role in a small company. And I think like I jumped the gun in terms of probably should have took a little bit more time and been a little bit more deliberate, but some of it was some anxiety of, Hey, this is a good job. I know the people. Um, I don't think I took the right amount of time to really look at my options. Uh, and and I don't I think I ended up you know I, I was there probably about six or eight months and then I transitioned and you know I, I had I learned a tremendous amount about business I learned a lot of things but it wasn't necessarily the experience it didn't pan out the way I thought like you know um, in terms of success and I, I hold nothing against uh, those guys I mean they are great human beings and they gave me an opportunity and I'm forever grateful for that but I wasn't a cultural fit necessarily it was too much of a transition coming out of the military yeah um, so uh, I mean it's it's it didn't work out the exact way I wanted but it's not a complete failure because I learned a lot you know what I mean and I learned about myself and sometimes learning what you want is as important as learning what you don't want and it's okay to learn in the civilian world and then move on to something else. And from that, I moved into, you know, doing my, running my own business um, and some of those skills I take with me. I love what you said um, during the panel. If you're not networking, you're not working. Is it, did I get that right? And yes. I, I wrote that down actually yes. in this book. Yeah, 100% true. Um, everything I have, a large majority of it, I've gotten through networking on, on my boat charter business. A lot of it is marketing and repeat business, um, but it's the same kind of networking skills, the ability to connect with people and remember them. And, you know, so I have like in, in the boat business, we'll have people that charter with us two or three times a summer and have been for like the last three years while we've been in and that's returning that's, business returning customers returning customers right longevity yeah those things are important and it's it's the same skill in networking like you know you see people especially in in business like in the tech industry and other industries i work in you'll see people and you'll see them again and again and mm -hmm. they remember you or they you know you remember something about the conversation and uh you know then it turns into a kind of a budgeting relationship and then you know a blossoming relationship and then you know they want to work with you yeah um, and that's that's turned into business for me and turned into to, 
to me being successful. So with that, what two to three books that are about networking, transitioning out of the military, and business do you would you recommend? And if you're not a big reader, what podcasts or what yeah. you know uh, articles or YouTube channels? Uh, yeah. I'm not a big reader, but uh, I have. <laughs> I only read, read some, books on tape. Some, no. <laughs> some business books, yeah, I know. I, you know, again, the attention for it is where yeah. I struggle. Um, some of my favorite books, the the Millionaire Next Door. Okay. Um, you know, and I don't know if if you've read it, but it's it's about a guy that did marketing and he studied people that were worth two to ten million dollars and wrote a book about their habits and their spending but the the essence of the book is that the millionaire that you think like Shaq and Kobe it's actually a guy in a middle class the majority of them middle class neighborhood not the biggest house in the neighborhood driving a Ford F-150 or an older Mercedes yeah all right, so just facts about what these people spent their money on and how they spent their money. And um, I think that's essential to what I talked about today in terms of the preparation, right? The preparation, it gives you the ability to take bigger risks yeah. in terms of where you work and how you work and how much you work. Um, those habits. Uh, Good to Great is a tremendous book. Um, and it's just about building a business and waiting for the point where why certain businesses took off at a certain point and and it was just you know little things that they did along the way and kept you know pushing a flywheel is what they call it and then at some point it spun off um and trying to find that moment and having the patience to wait for that moment and make the right decisions along the way so those two are really good i really like leadership secrets of attila the hun um because it talked about Attila as a multi-dimensional leader, not necessarily just a vicious killer. Yeah. Um, and I mean, he did kill people. Yeah. But it was always for effect and for a message. And he also spent time in the Roman court learning how learning diplomacy, right? So he wasn't. He hated it there, but he took everything he learned there, and turned it into success on the battlefield and use it against them in multiple ways. So I think that kind of strategic thinking and that openness to exposing yourself to other things or learning while you're exposed, not, not intentionally, um, are skills that transition to life and transition to business. Those are three books that I've never heard of. And I ask that question. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, you hear it on podcasts all the time. People say, oh, what two to three books you recommend? It's kind of like that's a dumb question. But I always say, hey, what are your two to three books on you know, conversation, but for the leadership book, Attila the Hunt, I've yet to hear about that one, so I want to oh, check yeah. that one out. Yeah, I don't like to read, so it's only like 100 pages. So Perfect. Like, yeah, that's anybody why I love, can read it, even people that don't like to read. It's, yeah, that's why I love Make Your Bed by Admiral McCraven, because it's just oh, it's a yeah. small pocketbook, right? There's yeah. just a bunch of one-liners, but... Uh, Great speech, too. Yeah, so I actually watched the speech for, like, uh, when I read the book, I'd already watched the speech, and it was something better, so as I'm reading the book, I'm hearing his voice and the yep. music playing, and... I don't know, it was just made it better. I feel like yeah, I I'm, I'm a big admirer. Uh, he was the JSOC commander while I was serving there, one of them that I served under. Um, and I've met him, I got a picture with him. That's awesome. In my house, like, yeah, big, because of what he did with POTIF and, you know, the risks he took for preservation of the force and family as a commander, I thought, you know, I, I will always be an admirer of Admiral McCraven. Yeah, uh, definitely a dream uh, podcast guest. Um, my questions are kind of miscellaneous just because I, I wanted to pick a couple different transition topics. Yeah, but okay. I thought when I was, before you walked up here, I was scribbling everything and just things. I was like, oh, this be based on what you had said earlier. Okay. So um, kind of some nuggets that you were laying out there. What are keys to establishing, establishing a unique style without getting pigeonholed? Because I think that's a trap, too, that a lot of people fall into in the military is they just get specialized in one thing or they think this is it. I'm just going to go all in on this one area but yeah what are what is yeah what's something of like what are some keys to establishing a unique style without getting pigeonholed yeah so when you say unique style you you talking like experiencing different things or i purposely uh typically when i ask questions like this i, I try to be general or broad because okay. i don't want to frame the answer i, I okay guess, yeah so just whatever you feel yeah. instantly comes to your mind 
Uh, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is what I talked about in that panel, which is what makes me unique a lot in, in the outside world is that I did many different things. I worked in special operations. I worked in airlift. I worked in test and acquisition. I worked on the joint staff. I worked, you know, in presidential airlift. Like, so I had this kind of smorgasbord of experiences, right, that... You know, when I go to companies and they ask me, like, wh you know, what have you done? Or, or we just have casual conversation. And, and I was like, yeah, you know, I, I did this. And I did it. And they're like, holy cow, man. Like, yeah. you know, what, what didn't you do? But that gives you a kind of confidence. And that, I think, from a stylistic perspective, is, is born of a growth mindset. Okay. Like, I wasn't afraid to try new things, right? Like, I didn't fear like when they said you know they came to me at, at, at when I thought I was going to retire and said hey we want you to help stand up the Space Force like I didn't fear that like I loved the challenge because I was like okay everything is going to be different and you know it's all about change and, and being creative and that's my style right so I'm like all right I mean I wasn't planning on doing this but you know I'll give it a shot and and I had the right teammates you know, Toby Toberman and, and Kate yeah. Wright telling me, which is another part of my style is I have friends that I trust and teammates that I trust that can see my blind spots and also see opportunities for me. And my style is I rely on my close circle to point those things out. Um, you know, and it, that's, uh, I think that's worked really well for me. And, and so my style is to always be growing and willing to try new things and be creative and uh, the openness to, to the advice of others. That's key right there. I love that, the, the openness to the key advice from others. Do you have time for a few more questions? Oh, man, I got all day. Perfect. Uh, hey, really speaking good. of style, yeah. uh, I just have to commend you on your style because it's, uh, it's, it's cool. Oh, I appreciate that. And you Thank talked you. about a growth mindset. Let's talk about, you know, I love the, the growth hair, <laughs> the hair set because yeah. most people, they grow it on the face, but yeah. I love I saw an old picture of you from last year. Yeah. I, I really want, like, you know, there's too many bald chiefs right now. You look now. good, man. That's, I, you know. I really want to, like, put it to them every chance I get. Like, and you I know, feel like it, you're giving, like, two extra inches on you. Yeah. You're a tall guy. Yeah. How tall are you? 6'2", uh, 6'3". Six two, six yeah, six like, well, you're 6'5", with, with the hair. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, it was something that, you know, I, when I got out, like, I wanted to capture my individuality. Right? I wanted to not be the same person I was. And I, I come places like here and people call me chief nonstop. And, you know, I take that in. I appreciate that respect. But, you know, once we get in the conversation, I'm immediately like, hey, you know, my name's Shane. You know, yeah. like, you, you, and yes, chief. That's what yeah. I normally Sh tell Shane you. Shane with the good socks. <laughs> yeah, Shane with the good socks or whatever you want to call me. But, um, you know, I just, part of my style as well is to be an individual right to to transition from the military and transition into into individuality a lot of which i i either suppressed or you know i had certain rules that that i kind of colored within you know i mean to to play those parts and play those roles um and now i want you know again freedom is is one of my priorities so yeah. i want stylistic freedom i want you know creative freedom yeah you know, I want financial freedom, right? And and everything I do lays out based on my values that, that you know, that's pretty important to me. I wrote that, I wrote that down earlier. Yep. I had that question is um, align my values and then, you know, look for whatever position. Absolutely. Where do I want to spend my time? What are my talents? Yeah. Uh, you said that in a matter of like 10 seconds. I was like, slow down, Shane. <laughs> like not, Sorry, man. No, 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 it was good. I mean, it was yeah. great. You were in the moment. Yeah. And um, it's, it, everything you said was resonating. So as we're, as, you, as we're going through the panel, I was asked, I was just thinking, like, man, I got to talk to this guy. Like, I want to do a podcast. And I, I truly appreciate it again. Yeah. Um, and I didn't realize you were a retired chief until uh, it said that. And then, But I feel like, I've seen, like your last name is someone... That's something you're gonna forget, right? And I was yeah. like, man, do I remember this name? But hopefully, it was up for something good. It was something good, <laughs> uh, and more than just socks, right? You know, you talked about 
don't have the fixed timeline when you're getting out. Because I've heard that so many times. I mean, I have hundreds of people that have retired over the years. You know, we say, oh, I'm taking six months off or three months. And, you know, you reference just taking a month off. But And for me, I feel like I'd say three months, but it'd probably be like two months and I'd start getting itchy, right? Yeah. And I feel like you kind of lose your edge. You get into a sloppy routine. But what is one of the best or most worthwhile self-investments uh, you made, we'll say your last five years in the military, and then the past year since you've retired? Uh, so we'll say the past six years. Um, a self-investment I made, uh, two things. One, taking the job. To, to help stand up the Space Force, I feel, yeah. was was a self-investment. And I didn't see it that way. What year time. was this? That was 2020. Okay. That was, uh, so the first two years of the stand-up, I was there. Um, and I, because uh, it was like a chance, right? Mm -hmm. It was a risk. I could have gotten out. I could ha have gone into industry at that point. <clears throat> but I chose to kind of invest in my passion uh, and invest in, in in people on that team. Like I was saying, invest in people that were like-minded on that team and, and doing something historic and cool. Um, I also, during that time, I, I well, during the last six years, I, I invested in that boat business that I started with, with a business partner. Um, that, was, that was a pretty cool investment, like I said, that was started as kind of a side hustle, you know, with a tax benefit. That, <laughs> yeah. It <laughs> turned into like real work and real business, you know, fortunately. Um, but during the time I was at Spitters Force, it, w it was pretty stressful because we had so much work to do in such a short time. And, and I had joined a CrossFit gym, gym at the time. So like I actually was investing in my health yeah. while I was under a lot of stress. And I, and I thought that was really good, you know, cr CrossFit, you know, it's like a cult, right? Like, you know how you know somebody does CrossFit. Yeah, they tell you. They tell you in 30 seconds. Was this, were you in D.C. or? Yeah, I was you... at Old Town CrossFit yeah. at the time. Was and this in Al Alexandria? In Alexandria, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, like I look back and I was reflecting today because I spoke about commitment today and about the Space Force values, which was, was my project. And uh, I was talking, to, I was like, as I was talking through like how hard it was and how much work it was, I was like, man, I'm, how did I handle that? And then I remembered that I was really CrossFit and I was in the shape of my life. Um, I'd never been in that kind of shape, like insane shape. Um, the best shape of your life? I think it was. And you were obviously like in your forties or like late thirties? Yeah, I was in my forties. That's um, awesome. Yeah. And you know, to, to get to that point, at this point in my life, like it was, it was awesome. I think for my health, I need to get back there because I got lazy since. But um, yeah, that that investment in health and and you know in in energy to produce more energy to do the work that I needed, which was an investment, you know, and you know also to to start this business on the side that that then got really busy. Um, I think those were incredible investments. Um, yeah, I, I'll say that. Like, and it's not like a traditional investment. Like, but you can look at an opportunity as an investment, and a lot of people don't do that. Like, you by taking this opportunity, the things you learn, the growth you have, the things you're able to to achieve. You know, that follows me now for the rest of my life. Like, you know, businesses that I work with. Like, you know, I don't. I try not to lead with my resume, but they'll do it for me. They'll be like, hey, this is Shane. Like, and, and he was on the space staff, and he was the guy that did the values, you know? And they're super proud to be working with me because I did that. Yeah. And I never thought, like, okay, people are going to want this to be like, yeah, I was just like, this is something cool that I did. But to them, like, it, it matters that, that I did that. That's That's really cool to have. No, it's awesome. I didn't realize you were the guy behind the, the values. Yeah. Like I said, I, I don't toot my own horn. And it was a, a group effort. It was a lot of people. But, you know, I took a lot of the face shots at the beginning. So I don't feel... Of course, right? Like, I feel very comfortable. Someone's got to get blamed. Taking some credit, so... Um, I had Chief Toberman on my podcast yesterday. Oh, yeah. And it's uh, it's going to be a great one. I have to edit every... Uh, so I'll He's a brilliant, it. brilliant guy. Yeah, and he's, we talked for probably close to an hour. 
wow. and we we were just digging in, or I was just digging in, and um, <laughs> he had he paused, but it was it was great. Actually, uh, this is random thought. He uh, asked him a question about uh, same a book question, but with a different uh, context. But he referenced the uh, the book Moneyball by Michael Lewis. Oh yeah. Right, seen and the I, movie, and I've seen the movie, and I love the book. Yeah, he's also uh, wrote the book of the uh, Big Short that, or uh, well, he wrote the book which the movie The Big Short is based off of. I okay, think. you know, uh, but I believe that's right. I have to double check that. But either way, um, yeah, I don't know why I just thought of that. <laughs> hey, so regarding again, just transitioning out of the military, and you've, you've probably learned a lot in the past year. But what is bad advice you hear often in regard to people advising someone when they get out or as they're transitioning? Oh, yeah. Um, money talk is is sometimes poisonous, right? And, and this is when money is poisonous, when you have an expectation and it's it's okay to know your value, but when you set a number on your value... Like, your value is so much more than a number that people pay you. You know, it could be benefits, it could be the team you get to work with, it could be an incentive package. So people going into a job, like, saying, oh, I'm not taking less than this, and sometimes their numbers are ridiculous, right? And you want know, like, 2.7 yeah. million. <laughs> no, how about 200,000? Yeah. And you're really only worth, like, 130. Right. And and you can't tell them that because then, you know, they get a hurt feelings report. But, um, you know, we tell them anyway or I'm like, OK, well, let me know how that works out for you. Um, but, you know, money, it's it's not the be all end all. And I, I incidentally, I have a friend that just took a fifty thousand dollar a year pay cut. You know, and, and you know, I won't mention you know, who he is or what, but was in a job, you know, making 200 and was miserable and took another job for 150. And I was like, dude, like, I have so much respect for that, that action, because so many people talk about do what fulfills you and do this, you know, and then they, they go to company X and, and they slave because they become a slave to a lifestyle yeah. You know, and they become a slave to bragging to their friends about what they have and what they make um, when that's not really a fulfilled life. Um, you know, so, you know, the fact that he took that action, because he was saying for months, he's like, I'm miserable, I hate it, I don't want to go there anymore. You know, he's like, yeah, they're paying me this, it doesn't matter, I'm miserable. And then he took action on it. And I was like, man... Bravo to you, because so many people stick it out. You know, they 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 get comfortable in that yeah. that money. So that's a big one. You know, the other one is um, like I talked about people going, "Hey, you know, how can I be you?" Like I, I never want to hear that question. Like you you're not gonna be me. You're gonna be you. You may do similar things. How can I be in that industry? How can I? You know, it's such a, a misnomer that you're going to be me. And you don't know my life and you may not want it, right? Like, it's it's not easy being me, trust me. Um, so, you know, I just kind of get thrown off. And I understand, like, what people are saying. They're not coming from a malicious place. But I'm also kind of like, man, you're not asking the right questions. You know, and, and, and that's a mistake and a missed opportunity. Because a lot of times people ask a question and they already have the answer in mind that they want. Like, well, if you do this, this, and this, just like the Air Force, right? A checkbox, right? Yeah, here's here's the boxes to check. <clears throat> Shazam, you're me, and you, you know, sitting here in a suit doing a podcast. No, no. <laughs> right? That's not how it works. Uh, so I had to change my, I, 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 I changed my mindset over the past couple of years because I, I listened to a podcast I don't remember the gentleman's name, but they were talking about dollar values and people get caught up. I like I knew someone when they were retiring or they said, I'm not going to retire until I have $2 million in the bank. But then I'm thinking, I'm like, what is so magical about that number? Because that's a lot of money. But to me, yeah. you're not like you're going to live well, but you're not you're not really getting private jets or right. You're not right. It's not like 
Yeah. Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg uh, money. So I, but anyway, in this podcast, they talked about it's more important to what's your rich. What's right? your rich life? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, and like having specific things. So for example, and then just basing like, okay, I want to do these things each year without having to worry about, oh, now we have to eat ramen and bologna sandwiches for the yeah. next month. And then, okay, like this, it's, this costs this much, if, you know, an extra $20,000 a year. So for example, my rich is anytime I have a flight that's longer than four hours, I want to fly first class. Yeah. Right. And not sweat about it or, or take two big family trips a year where we go to Spain for three weeks or something. And granted, that's going to cost some money, right? Yeah, that's, that's expensive. But just as an example, or, or maybe just a family vacation, hey, we go out to the a woods for, you know, or a cabin for two weeks. And someone else's rich was, as an example, they want to be able to do their grocery shopping full time at Whole Foods and then not sweat it versus just picking up. Yeah, that's real rich. Yeah, that's that's more than Spain. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> yeah. But, and it, but anyway, it changed my mindset on thinking like, what is my rich? And yeah, there's a there's a guy with a, a whole series on, on YouTube. I watched it, Living Your Rich Life. What's his name? I can't remember his name. It might be the same guy that... Yeah, uh, was it an Indian guy? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I watched that series. And I thought it was really good. And then I, I sent it to my son, you know, I wanted him to watch it as well. But the philosophy is sound. Like, you may find that the number you need to do all the things that make you happy is far less. Like... Money does not make people happy. It's proven. You know the suicide rate, rate among rich people is yeah. I is mean, just as billionaires, high. you know, millionaires, billionaires. Uh, there have been generals. Absolutely, all the time. So um, relationships make people happy, right? So it's a it's a people issue. What do you want to spend your time doing? What do you want to spend your time? Who do you want to be able to spend your time with? Like, there's so many other intangibles that have nothing to do with how much money you make or that can be done without chasing a number. Uh, financial advisors will do an analysis and tell you, hey, you know, this is the number you need to live the current lifestyle you're yeah. So you need to decide, like, is the way you're living right now you're really your rich life or is it just the way you're living right now? Yeah. Right? Um, I, don't, I don't fixate on numbers. I mean, I think I almost got in a fight one time with a dude in a bar because he was so mad at me, like, for not... He's like, I don't care about my number. He's like, you got to know your number. And I was like, well, no, I don't. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, but, you know, like, yeah, man, that's, money is poisonous. Like, not money is a poisonous. Fixation with money is poisonous. Um, and it, it ruins people in a lot of ways. And, and I see it very often. And I think it's a problem, right? Um, yeah. Or I wouldn't, I wouldn't mention it. Like, learn how to handle money, learn how to manipulate money, learn how to save money, most importantly. Um, because there's, there's, a, there's a discipline of not being there yet, but there's also a discipline when you get there, you know, which is something like I would have loved to talk about entrepreneurship all day today, but w what do you do when you retire and all of a sudden you're making $100,000 more than you've ever made your whole life? Like, do you have a plan for that, right? Because the discipline of plenty is the same as the discipline of, it's, it's not the same, but it is the same. But it's, it's actually it's different because when, when you're broke, like being disciplined might be, hey, look, we can't go out because we ain't got it. It's a great workout plan though. Yeah. It's a great way. Yeah. What if you can go out every time you want to go out? What if you could buy everything you, you've ever wanted? Should you? You know what I mean? And people don't think that way, but that's a real issue because you can make a ton of money and, and be more broke than you were when you didn't have anything if you don't have disciplined habits. You know? That was referenced today. I, I don't want to say the ranks, but cause it might give it away. But just people you would think are should be well off, married couples with amazing jobs. But I think that's an unspoken transition aspect that. We really don't think about or just talk a whole like the discipline with money because you're right because people are going to get their military retirement maybe get something from the va right va you know and then you, you go and get a, a decent job and all of a sudden i mean i had the same discussion with a friend of mine like okay you're about to make a hundred thousand dollars more this year have you thought about that you thought about the tax implications of that you thought about 
what you're going to do with that. You thought about how you're going to keep yourself under control. Yeah. Um, like, that's something we need to talk about. Like, among even higher ranking people, because it's not how much money you make, it's how much you spend. There's a lot of broke doctors and lawyers running around. Athletes. And athletes. Right? I mean, you see, these guys are uh, making, you know, some hundred million dollars over the course of the career. Yep. All right, just wrapping up. Yeah. If there was a movie made about your life, I'm not going to ask, uh, yeah, I'm going to ask who would play you, and then what would the name of your movie be? Wow, who would play me? Uh, I mean, I would love to be James Bond. Okay. But like an old school James Bond, like Sean Connery, um, you know, or Roger Moore. Roger Moore is actually he my He was favorite. actually my favorite Bond. Yeah, because he was, he was goofy, but he was the smoothest in my yeah. book. So yeah, Roger Moore would play me. Like young Roger Moore, not old Roger Moore, and um, and really, I think you know the title of my movie or the soundtrack of my life would be "Make Your Own Luck." You know, luck is where preparation and opportunity meet. If if you're prepared and you're open, um, you know. Have you ever read The Alchemist? Is another yes. book of mine. You know what? It's funny because uh, Toadman I asked him about like, hey, what books you recommend, and he recommended The Old Man in the Sea. Oh yeah, great. And then I, I told him uh, when I did podcast with Chief Wright almost six years ago, I asked him, and that's I said Chief Wright recommended that same exact book, and uh, there was another book, and I couldn't think of it, but it was The Alchemist. Yeah, he, I I got that book from K Wright. Uh, he he recommended that to me. The Old Man in the Sea I read in high school. You know, phenomenal book too about yeah. perseverance, but. Um, you know, the alchemist principle says that the universe is conspiring, whatever you believe the universe is, so it could be God or, you know, nature yeah. or whatever, to put you in a position. You just have to be ready to accept it, right? And, and so my whole life, like I think, things have happened to me for a reason, and I've been lucky or fortunate enough, but I've also been prepared and open to opportunity. And, uh, that's really made the difference in, in my success. So make your own luck. Like, go yeah. out and get it. Who are three people you want to give a shout out to? Ah, three people I want to give a shout out to. So my wife, Crystal, uh, my son, Julian, and, uh, and my mom. That's awesome. Yeah. Last question. If there was a giant billboard that you could place anywhere in the world with your message on it and everyone had to see and read it, where would you put the billboard and what would your message say? I'd put it at Times Square in New York City because okay. I uh, want to be on Times Square. Right next to the old Mark Wahlberg, Kevin Klein ad from way back when. <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want the underwear on me. Um, what would it say? I mean, I, 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 you know, I think my, my slogan I talked about is really about something about, you know, making your own love. But um, I think uh, something I said at my retirement was like, I felt like in my career, I didn't lead with the fact that I was different enough. Like, you know, I, I was born in the Caribbean. I grew up in the Caribbean until you know high school in New York and I never really spoke about it a lot because I felt like you know in the military it was better to just kind of conform and fly mm -hmm. under the radar um, but what I said at my retirement was people should lead with their differences because our differences make us a stronger team right and, and it's it's almost better for our national security to acknowledge how different we are and then use those strengths to be better as a nation so I would just put, you know, I'd put lead with your differences. Perfect. Actually, one bonus question. If people want to learn more about you, where should they go? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. So, you know, Shane Pilgrim, P-I-L-G-R-I-M. Uh, I should probably be the only one on there. Uh, my company's Kaya, Kaya Co Consulting. So if you put those things together, um, you know, love to connect or, or reach out to me with a question. Happy to to help anybody that I can, particularly veterans or, yeah. or, or anyone else. Um, you know, as, as long as I have the time, like, y you can have the benefit of anything I can give you. Um, yeah, so that's, that's probably the best place 
you know, especially from a business perspective, because I am so, <laughs> so all over the place, but I do, I am a regular on LinkedIn. Perfect. I appreciate a connection. Yeah. And I'll link all this in the show notes. Perfect. Shane, thank you so much. Uh, this is really cool and I appreciate the flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Thank you for just, uh, giving me the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I was happy to do that. I, I enjoyed the conversation. It's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Best no, of luck good. to you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone that wraps it up. Take care.